Hello, my name is Reverend Philip Schenker of the Family Federation for World Peace and Unification. And it's my privilege to introduce you to this lecture series, an introductory series on the divine principle, a new and profound expression of the ancient truths taught in the Bible and expressed in the world's great faiths. Let us begin. By way of introduction, let us first consider the purpose and value of human life. We can recognize that everyone on earth is struggling to attain happiness and at the same time to avoid suffering or misfortune. Well, let us ask, what is it that makes a human being happy? Immediately our answer would be that people feel joy when their desires are fulfilled. But we had better recognize that desire has many expressions. We have desires within us that reflect our original nature to be and to do good. Now when we express these desires, we find satisfaction, a sense of confidence and integrity, and we can look people straight in the eye and have confidence in ourselves. However, there are other desires within us that when we express those out of selfishness or a moment of need or greed, we may find a moment's satisfaction or relief from pressure, but ultimately the pang of conscience will overtake us. Within the self-same individual are two opposing inclinations, the original mind, which desires to be and to do good, and an evil or selfish mind which seems to pursue a more wicked and corrupt purpose. Now these two natures are engaged in a fierce battle, striving to accomplish these two contradictory and conflicting purposes. Which one of us has not experienced the struggle within when we find ourselves knowing we should do something but not having the will or the strength to do what we know is right? Or conversely, knowing that there's an action we should not take. But when no one is looking, we can't overcome the desire, the temptation to do it. Now, any being possessing such a contradiction within itself will struggle with its own self-identity and is ultimately doomed to perish. Christianity sees this state of destruction as the result of the human fall. Let's consider how the impact of that decline or that descent of humanity has impacted our understanding of the world. Considered from the viewpoint of the intellect, the human fall represents humanity's descent into ignorance. We can say that people are composed of two aspects, internal and external, or mind and body. Likewise, the intellect consists of two aspects, an internal and an external aspect. In the same way, there are two types of ignorance, internal and external. Now, internal ignorance refers to our ignorance about the fundamental questions of life. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? Is there life after death? What is good? What is evil? How should I relate with the larger world? And what is my place or purpose in the universe? From time immemorial, human beings have sought the, the answer to these questions. External ignorance refers to our ignorance of our environment, the nature of matter, how our physical body, human body works. These comprise together these two aspects of ignorance. Now, through religion, humanity has followed the path of searching for internal truth. Anthropologically, from the time human life arose on the face of the earth, we find that human beings were compelled to be awed by the power of nature, to recognize in those powers something greater, to seek to worship or relate or uh, uh, appease those powers. Naturally arose the desire to take care of the souls of their departed loved ones. And so funerals, unlike the animals before them, we began these kinds of rituals and practices. So through religion, humanity has followed the path of searching for internal truth. At the same time, through science, humanity has pursued the external truths. 
In this way, we've sought to understand how our physical body works, the nature of matter, and how the universe operates, the laws and principles, and to improve the conditions of life for all people. Now, these two endeavors, pursuing different realms of the human experience, have seemed at times in the course of their development to take positions that were contradictory or even irreconcilable, such as the biblical understanding of six days of creation versus science's awareness that life evolved over a long period of time. But these are not necessarily contradictory. And in fact, for humankind to completely overcome the two aspects of ignorance and fully realize the goodness which our original mind desires, at some point in history, there must emerge a new truth which can reconcile religion and science and resolve their problems in an integrated understanding. This is one of the missions of the new truth, to bring about this harmonized view of life and in that way empower us to realize a world of goodness. What else can we say about the mission of the new truth? Well, first of all, this truth should be able to lift humanity through a broad and unified vision into a new age, a new world. At the same time, the truth should be able to embrace all historical religions, ideologies, and philosophies, be able to understand these varying perspectives, provide the big picture, and show the relevance of each part, and in this way, bring harmony and unity among them. Also, this new truth should be able to empower human beings to overcome the contradiction within our nature and guide fallen people to return to our original state and regain our original nature and value. Now, this is precisely what the divine principle has the power to achieve. This teaching is not the result of philosophical inquiry or academic library research. It is revealed understanding. It came as a revelation. It is presented in a format relevant to people of today and approaches the problems of life in much the same way that any modern person would approach a problem. For example, when we are sick, we go to a doctor. Why we go to a medical professional to solve the problem is because he or she has been trained in this area. A doctor first must study anatomy, how the body works, what is the blueprint, and what's the ideal structure and function of a healthy body. Secondly, a doctor then can study pathology, how disease arises, where does the body tend to break down, what is the problem that causes health, or bad health or, or, or problems. And then thirdly, we can study, a doctor can study therapy, how to cure these problems and restore the original state of health that the body was designed to be in. In exactly the same way, the divine principle is expressed in three major parts. The first, which we'll hear today, is the principle of creation, a blueprint for the purpose, the structure, and the function of life in the universe. How the universe was designed to function, its principles and nature, the nature of its first cause, the Creator, whom we call God. And in the midst of that, a deeper understanding of the purpose and value of our own human life. The second part of the principle is the human fall, to understand exactly how the contradiction arose that has undermined our ability to realize these dreams and why the world of our reality is so different than the world of our dreams. Thirdly, the principle of restoration, showing how, through history and the process of reaching out through religious understanding and truth, God has worked to restore humankind back to our original position, original, original value, and original nature. Now, as I said, this truth is revealed understanding. Its purpose is ultimately to resolve the fundamental problems of human life and the universe, and it is the teaching of Reverend Sun Myung Moon. Now, one final point before we begin. 
Whenever new truth has been revealed throughout human history, we find that human beings tend to resist or even reject this new understanding because we want to somehow cling to our traditional ways and the comfortable truths that we've known. Consider this example. In the earliest understandings of human beings, we, re we related to the powers of nature by trying to appease them through offerings and through sacrifices. This age in the Bible is conveyed as the time of Abraham, and this, these were the traditions before and during Abraham's time. Now, it was Abraham's descendants who received a new truth through Moses and a new understanding through Ten Commandments and 613 laws, a God of justice, righteousness, and a response, a moral standard for human beings to live in relationship with God. But the people didn't easily receive Moses' teaching. They resisted. And when Moses went up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, they immediately rebuilt the golden calf and began idol worship and sacrifice. Now, ultimately, the truths of Moses were established as the tradition of the Old Testament. And it was these people of Israel that were prepared for the coming of the Messiah. Now, once again, when Jesus came as the Messiah to the very people who had been waiting for him for 2,000 years, they couldn't see him. They rejected him. They resisted. Why? Because he did not repeat what they had already learned in the Old Testament. Jesus brought a new gospel, an understanding of a God of love, a God of grace. <clears throat> and Jesus acted in such a way that seemed to undermine their traditions. And they accused him for defiling the Sabbath, for breaking their laws, and for changing their traditions. Thus, Jesus felt compelled to say things like, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He said, you worry about cleansing the cup and the plate. Why don't you worry about cleansing your inner self? Now, when Jesus taught, even then, he was unable to share everything that he knew and had prepared. He said in John 16, 12 and 25, I have yet many things to share with you, but you cannot bear them now. He said, I've spoken of earthly things and you can't understand. How can I tell you of heavenly things? Jesus promised in the 16th chapter of John that the spirit of truth would come and eventually guide us into all truth. Now, St. Paul echoed this perspective in his first letter to Corinthians, 13th chapter, 9th through 12th verses, when Paul noted the limitation of our faith and our understanding. He said, our knowledge is imperfect. Our prophecy is imperfect. Now we see dimly through a glass, but the time will come when we see face to face. Now we understand in part, but the time must come when we understand fully, even as we have been fully understood. Paul used a metaphor of growing up. He said, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I spoke like a child, I understood like a child. But when I grew up I, and became a man, I put away childish things. My brothers and sisters, through the divine principle, we can now come to a new understanding of our traditional faith. And in many areas of that faith, we can put away childish things. Let us begin with the principle of creation. We begin from those fundamental questions about human life and the universe. Throughout history, people have anguished over these fundamental questions. This is because no one has fully understood the root principle, the blueprint, by which humanity and the universe were originally created. To approach this topic properly, it is not enough for us to simply examine the resultant reality, the world that we can measure externally. The proper way to address this, the fundamental question, is that of the causal reality. Problems concerning human life and the universe cannot be solved without first understanding the nature of God. So section one is the dual characteristics of God and the created universe. To begin with, 
we have to ask, how can we know the divine nature of the invisible God? As you know, there are some who deny God's existence based on the fact that we can't see Him, can't touch Him, can't encounter Him physically, and can't measure. But this in itself is not legitimate. Because there are many things in our life that we cannot see, and yet we understand their existence because we see their result. Gravity, for example. We can't see gravity working, but we know what happens as a result. And so by observing the effect, we understand the cause and understand the law of gravity. Similarly, my mind. Now, you can't see my mind, but I hope you'll give me the benefit of the doubt that I have one because I'm expressing my thoughts, feelings, passion, ideas in the way that it's coming out of my physical body. So again, you see the effect and you understand the invisible cause. So it's not legitimate to deny God's existence simply because we can't measure, see, touch, or experience with our physical senses. In fact, by definition, if we're seeking to understand the first cause of the created world, the world that exists in time and space, then would that cause, the cause of the world that's defined by time and space, would that cause be within time or be the origin of time itself? Would that cause be within space or would space be within God? Therefore, I think you know the answer. Therefore, we say that God is infinite, not finite, beyond space. It doesn't simply mean that God is everywhere. It actually means that God is not defined by a specific location within the limited realm of space. And we say God is eternal. That doesn't just mean that God is always here for all time, but beyond time, without being defined by a beginning point and an end point within the limited realm of time, which is a facet of the visible world. So how can we then know the divine nature of the invisible God? Well, one way to fathom God's deity is by observing the universe that he created. Just as we come to know the character of an artist through his works, let's look more closely. So we can understand the nature of God by observing the diverse things of the creation. For example, in the plays of Shakespeare, we find a diversity of topics, but common themes that run throughout these plays, the struggle between men and women, the battle between good and evil, the uh, 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 imagery of light versus dark. Now, these themes are consistently running through all of the plays and tell us something about the nature of the author. Then if we find recurrent themes that are expressed in every single form of life, from simple to complex, will it not tell us something about the author of life. Likewise, look at the paintings by Van Gogh. You look at 10 paintings, you could recognize the characteristic style of the artist, even though the subject matter is different, because the style reflects the artist's passion, emotion, and inner nature. So just as we can understand Van Gogh by his paintings, or Shakespeare by his writings, we can understand something about the creator, the cause, by looking at the world he created, the visible effect. Therefore, St. Paul wrote in Romans 1.20, ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power, his deity, his godlike nature, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. So let's look first then at the common elements in the natural world. We'll begin by pointing out these elements that are found universally in all things. Every entity, first of all, possesses the dual characteristics of yang and yin, or as we would say in the West, positivity and negativity. More fundamentally, however, every entity also possesses another set of dual characteristics, that of outer form and inner quality. Now, the visible outer form resembles the invisible inner quality. The inner quality is called internal nature, while the shape or structure is called our external form. Now, 
When we say that the inner and outer aspect is more fundamental, let's consider, let's look at human beings. Before you are a man or a woman, you are more fundamentally human. And our human personality differentiates us from animals, plants, or any other living thing. Human personality arises from the inner nature, our thoughts, feelings, character, conscience, and how we express that in our visible form. So masculinity and femininity are attributes or expressions of human personality. And of course, every man, every woman has elements of both. A man is not all masculine and a woman is not all feminine. These are two essences that are harmonized within each person. Now, since internal nature and external form refer to corresponding inner and outer aspects of the same entity, then the external form could also be understood as a second internal nature, a visible expression of the internal nature. For this reason, we can tell a lot about a person by reading their face or their body language and how they sit or express themselves or even being able to, to evaluate things in their hand or the lumps on their head or how their body expresses itself because the body expresses the inner nature of the mind. So the internal nature and external form together constitute dual characteristics. Now let's look at every form of life in the universe in general. Let's look more closely at this. When we go to the most simple forms of life, particles here on your left, Particles exist as either positive, negative, or neutral because they have both elements within them. They make an electronic, magnetic relationship to form the basis of atoms. Atoms then form an electrochemical relationship by sharing an electron with another atom to form the basis of molecules. Molecules form electrochemical relationships to form the basis of matter. Matter arises and we see in the plant kingdom the dual characteristics of stamen and pistil or sporophyte, gametophyte. Coming up to animal life, we find that all animals express masculinity, male and female. Even animals that reproduce asexually have both aspects within one body. Even cells which reproduce by splitting, dividing through mitosis. That process is initiated by the give and take relationship of positive and negative elements within the nucleus. And then we come, of course, to human beings who have masculine and feminine as the foundation of our existence and reproduction and life. So we can see in every form of life, from simple to complex, this expression of the dual characteristics of masculinity and femininity, or positivity and negativity, two equally valuable yet complementary aspects that allow for the existence and life of each being. Now, when we consider again from the other set of dual characteristics, character and form, when we look at energy in its most fundamental level, Einstein in his theory of relativity showed us that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It has always been here, but it can change its state, and energy is the basis of matter. However, energy doesn't act at random, out of chaos, but the development of life is the process of energy becoming more ordered, more directed, more organized and developed. So energy seems to act according to a lawful, and principled nature. There's some inherent directive aspect that governs how life develops in the universe. When we look at matter, which is composed of energy, once again, we see in the laws of chemistry and physics that each of the elements in the periodic table acts and reacts according to its unique nature. Now, when we see these atoms and molecules come together and forming higher forms of life, such as plants. Plants act also according to a lawful, directive element within them. For example, the roots will always grow toward the water. The leaves will always follow the sun. Uh, yet we can't cut open a plant, pull out the law, and now the plant is going to be unclear and undirected. The plant's mind 
or its lawful nature is inherent within the nature of the plant. Likewise, animals, let's consider closely. Likewise, animals are governed by their animal mind, which is primarily based upon instinct. And human beings have all of these elements. Human beings have all of these elements, and yet we also have a deeper aspect of our mind. We have self-awareness. We have a moral capacity to evaluate good and evil. We, have, we, we, we recognize the moral law and are conscious of our relationship with the larger universe. Our conscience is the basis of the human mind. So once again, from simple to complex, we see that there is a consistent pattern that every single entity exists with these two sets of dual characteristics. Now let's consider the relationship between God's internal nature and external form and God's original masculinity and femininity. God's original internal nature and original external form each contain the expressions or attributes of original masculinity and original femininity. Similarly, when we look at human beings, we could understand that within our mind there are masculine and feminine natures, such as initiating and dominating and, and, and guiding versus nurturing and listening and reflecting, etc. Also, in our physical selves, there are masculine and feminine attributes. Within God, therefore, original yang and original yin, original masculinity and femininity are attributes of his original nature and his original external form. Now, within the first cause, God's original internal nature must contain the essences of all the law, principle, plant, uh, 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 inner natures of everything in the universe. And God's original external form must contain the essence of all the matter in the universe, which is itself energy. Likewise, within the Creator, there must be the essence of all the masculine natures in the universe as well as all the feminine natures in the universe. Now, the masculinity and femininity within the Creator is not some strange or foreign concept but actually, in the Bible, in Genesis 1.27, it is stated clearly, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So, man is not just males, but man is male and female in the image of God. Well, let's stay here. So, to summarize, we can say that God is the subject and the harmonious union of these natures of inner and outer, inner nature and external form. Likewise, God is the harmonious union of masculinity and femininity, which are manifestations or attributes of the qualities of His character and form, respectively. Now, God stands as the subject partner toward the universe, having the qualities of internal nature and masculinity or subjectivity in relationship with the universe, which responds to God and has the more external aspect or is feminine in response to God. This is the only reason we can justify calling God He or calling God our Father, because while containing both masculine and feminine natures, the position that God takes is the initiating subject and internal position or the masculine position in relationship to the universe. Now, the relationship between God and the universe can be summarized therefore thusly. God is the invisible subject partner and the universe as a whole is an object to God, an object partner. According to the principle of creation, God's dual characteristics manifest themselves in the universe, either symbolically or in image, as individual embodiments of truth, which constitute the universe. In other words, God expresses Himself in His image and likeness, human beings, or symbolically in the rest of the natural world. Let me explain. Every existing being is created reflecting the nature of God with character and form manifested masculine 
and feminine. These two sets of dual characteristics. This is universal, all forms of life. It's for that reason that when we want to understand our own structure and function in biology class, we will cut open a frog or some other animal to analyze the systems that are more simple versions of what has developed into us because life develops according to this consistent principle. Now, when we say human beings are in image and the rest of the natural world are symbolic in nature, please consider this. When a hyena laughs, he hasn't just heard a joke. You've heard of a laughing hyena, but he's not laughing at something that's funny, nor does he understand something being funny. Or more specific, but, but only symbolizes that element that we can relate to. Another good example would be if you would see a graceful swan gliding through the water, extending its neck like a ballet dancer, next to uh, an ugly duckling, wah, 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 going back and forth. Now, externally, one looks graceful and with repose and calm and beauty, while the other has a different external expression. But in fact, inside them, they are governed by the same instinctive desire 24 hours a day to find food. The swan is not actually being graceful, thinking gracefully, etc., but symbolizes that fact. In another sense, when we look at oh, the winter sky, in winter, when the trees are barren, when the sky has become gray, when the cold winds blow, there's a feeling of desolation and loneliness and reflection and depth that's evoked within ourselves as human beings. But the trees aren't lonely. The sky isn't sad. The natural world is only symbolically reflecting these qualities. But you and I as human beings, we feel them. We understand them. We can connect to them. That's why our relationship with the divine nature of our Creator is one where we can pray. We can reflect on these things. We can respond and relate to the nature of God. Let's say one final word about God's nature. What can we say about His inner nature? Well, the Bible tells us that God is a righteous God, a loving God a long-suffering God, a patient God, etc., etc. But by looking at the textbook of the universe, we can also understand the nature of the Creator by the world that He has made. What is it that allowed chaos to become cosmos? The foundation for this cosmos is that everything has order. There's order. Why is there order? because everything follows law. And behind these laws are purpose, value, and productivity. So there's principle behind these laws. Order, law, and principle is the foundation for the cosmos. As life arises, we see higher qualities of beauty, truth, and goodness. When we come to the animal world, we see love. But not just the instinctual love that we find in animals, when we come to the human a, a form of life, we find the spiritual capacity to be bonded even after our loved ones have long passed away. The spiritual capacity of heart and love. And when we, when we consider the laws of the universe, they aren't voted on periodically. They are eternal, unchanging, and absolute. Likewise, the true definition of beauty, truth, or goodness is that which is eternally true and universally true. And also the love we seek has the quality of being lasting and eternal. So when we look at the universe, we can recognize the expression of the nature of its creator, a God of order, law, and principle, beauty, truth, and goodness, love and heart, and a God who is eternal, unchanging, unique, and absolute. Now, let's consider Section 2, Universal Prime Energy, Give and Take Action, and the Four Position Foundation. More about the structure, the laws, and the functionality of the universe. First, Universal Prime Energy. God, the creator of all things, is the absolute reality. Not just a God that we evoke whenever we try to explain a mystery, 
but the essence of life at the heart of the way life operates and its character in nature. God is eternal, self-existent, and as we've discussed, transcendent of time and space. Now, therefore, the energy for God's existence, the fundamental energy of God's own being, is also, must be, absolute, eternal, and self-existent. Because the first cause exists with dual characteristics, that's the foundation through give and take for God's own power and existence. But not only is this energy the foundation for God's existence, it is the origin of all energies and forces that allow created beings to exist. We call this fundamental energy universal prime energy. Prime because it's the initial, original force, and universal because it's the energy that allows all beings to be sustained. Now let's consider how this fundamental force relates to the relationality of all things in creation, the principle of give and take action. Through the agency of universal prime energy, the subject and object elements of every entity which come out of God, express God, form a common base and enter into interaction. This interaction in turn generates the forces that every entity needs to exist, to reproduce, and to act. For example, proton and electron. Proton and electron establish a give and take relationship through electromagnetic chemical connection and form the foundation for a greater whole, an atom. Similarly, a man and woman enter into a love relationship and bear a child and form a family. Or, in everyday life, John Lennon and Paul McCartney came together, brainstormed, inspired each other, and wrote wonderful music. This is how life moves. All of the forces for existence, multiplication, and action are generated by the give and take action between subject and object. So universal prime energy facilitates a common base that allows interaction that create the forces for every entity to exist. This interaction, generating these forces through this process, we call give and take action. The fact is that nothing in the universe lives by itself or for itself. When we look in the natural world, we see that every system seeks balance, seeks balance, the balance between the predators in a particular environment and the prey. They will always seek a balance, the balance between high pressure and low pressure in a weather system, or the fact that, that plants provide oxygen for animals. Animals return carbon dioxide for plants. Plants become food for animals, and the animals, when they die, fertilize the soil and produce new growing plants. We can find throughout the creation this ecological balance, each ecosystem seeking that through harmonious relationships. Now look at the human body. Within our body, the same thing is true. Our fundamental vital systems operate through give and take relationship. For example, we inhale and we exhale. In addition, we assimilate food and that food goes to every cell in our body while the waste that comes back is then dissimilated. Assimilation and dissimilation. Our circulatory system, the arteries carry the oxygen and food to every cell and bring back the waste and gas. Now every system operates this way. Our muscles we have a voluntary and an involuntary system, and our muscles work in pairs. One contracts while the other relaxes to accomplish most of our actions. Similarly, our nervous system, we have a sympathetic and a parasympathetic nervous system. Look at our face. We have two eyes rather than one, so that these two comparison points give us depth perception because two different points are comparing in the brain constantly. That allows us to kick a soccer ball or to step up on the curb when we're walking, to balance and harmonize, to dance, to move in a coordinated way. And our brain is making thousands of calculations constantly uh, through reciprocal give and take relationships. We have two ears 
rather than one. So that we can tell not only the distance of a sound, but its direction as the brain immediately compares how the two different eardrums receive the decibels. And there are example after example after example in the human body. But let's look at human society and we can again see the principle of give and take action. That nothing lives by itself. What is a good society? It's where relationships are harmonious and healthy. Husband and wife, parent and child, brother and sister, friend and friend, teacher and student, government or leadership and people, uh, uh, employer, employee, etc. A harmonious society is one where there's good reciprocal relationships that begin with giving. It's not take and give or take and take but give and take. And this principle is also enshrined in the scriptures. The Bible says that wherever two or more are gathered in his name, he will be in their midst. And Jesus said, ask and it will be given. Knock and the door will be opened. Seek and you will find. Likewise, Jesus said, the measure, the, the, by the judgment you pronounce, you'll be judged. And the measure you give is the measure you will receive. Next, let's consider the principle of origin, division, union, action, and the process by which all beings come into existence. The process in which out of God, the origin, two entities are separately manifested and reunited into oneness by making a common base, having give and take action, and bringing about a new being is called origin, division, union action. And it's the process by which all beings come into existence. Let's consider then the next step. As a result of origin, division, union, action, four positions are formed. God the origin, the divided subject and object partners that express his dual characteristics, and the result of their relationship, a union. These four positions then constitute the foundation for the fulfillment of that being's existence. Now, any one of these four positions may assume the position of the subject partner and engage the other three as its object partners, forming a communion of three object partners. For example, God, of course, loves, cares for, and, and invests in each of the other three. And yet God will also respond to the needs, desires, or, 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 or situations of each of the other three. Likewise, a man may feel responsible to lead and protect and take responsibility for his family. But a mature man, a mature person, knows how to, recognizes that every relationship, every couple is unique. And a mature man knows how to listen to his wife when necessary, how to allow her to lead in the areas where she is strong. And every relationship is a dynamic one and involves not only husband and wife, but can be sometimes mother and son or father and daughter, or brother and sister, etc. And finally, a child, of course, is an object toward its father, mother, and ultimately the Creator. But also, when that child is in need, or has a desire, or expresses itself, parents will respond, as will God through them. So here we see these purposes of three objects for each of these beings. So let me summarize. When each of the four then acts as the subject partner, and enters into give and take with the other three revolving around it, they fulfill the three objects' purpose. When the origin, therefore, and the subject and object partner projected and their union fulfill these three object purposes, a foundation of four positions is established. God, subject, object, and union. This foundation of four positions is what every form of life in the universe strives to achieve and is defined by. So the foundation, the four position foundation is first of all the root of the principle of three stages. Because this comes about through origin, division, and union, we will see that there are three stages in the development of life, which we'll talk about later. And the number three is expressed in the nature of our reality in the universe in many ways. We'll talk about that. Secondly. The four position foundation is the root of the number 12 because as each of the four takes on three object partners, then 12 object partners are created. The four position foundation is the fundamental foundation of goodness 
and the realization of God's purpose of creation. It's how each being fulfills its purpose and reflects God's nature and ultimately achieves goodness by achieving the four position foundation. It's the fundamental foundation for the life of all beings, providing all the forces necessary for their existence. Therefore, we can say that the four position foundation is God's eternal purpose of creation because every being strives to achieve it. Now, in human life, what is this four position foundation? God, man, woman, and child. It is the family. Not just any family, but a God-centered family. And so Jesus said in the 19th chapter of Matthew, haven't you read that from the beginning he who made them, made them male and female, and said for this reason the two are to become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. And what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. From the beginning, we're created male and female to realize this relationship and bring about new life. How can two bodies become one flesh? Only by producing a child, a union that reflects both of the parents. This four position foundation, which in human life is the family, is God's eternal purpose of creation. Now, our next section is to take these processes and principles that, ex that are manifested in the development of the universe and apply them to understand the purpose of creation and the value of our human life. To begin with, the purpose of the creation of the universe. Now, after God completed each day of creation, He saw that it was good to behold. On each of the days of creation, He said it is good to behold, indicating that God derived joy out of the work of His creation and the reflection of himself. However, after the creation of human beings, God didn't say it's good, he said it is very good. A greater joy from his own image and likeness. And after the creation of human beings, God blessed them. In Genesis 1:28, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, and every living thing that moves on the earth. These three great blessings, fruitful, be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion, are ultimately fulfilled when the whole creation, including human beings, completes the four position foundation with God as the center. This is the kingdom of heaven, where ultimate goodness is realized, and where God feels the greatest joy and stimulation from the reflection of himself in his created work. God wanted his creations to be object partners, embodying his goodness, reflecting that goodness that God might take delight in them. Therefore, the ultimate purpose of the universe, with human beings at its center, is to return joy to God. Let's consider then how all of the, human, all of the universe can become good object partners for the joy of God. How is joy produced? Joy is not produced by an individual alone. If I would ask you, what is your favorite pastime? Some of you would say reading a book, others would say listening to music, talking to my friends, IMing on the computer, uh, chatting through the cell phone, going to the movies, playing a sport. But none of us would tend to say that my favorite pastime is to spend my time alone in a closet alone and, 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 and by myself. Only a person who is deeply wounded or even crazy would desire such an activity. The rest of us would always choose something that involves being stimulated by relationship with an object because that is the basis of joy. So joy is not produced by the individual alone. Joy rather arises when we have an object partner, whether intangible or substantial in which our internal nature and external form can be reflected and developed. So let's consider further. If, I were to, if we were to lock you in a room for one year and only feed you to sustain you for that year and with nothing else in the room and we gave you a choice of having one thing with you, what would you choose? If I gave you the choice between a rock 
and a plant. Only the geologists in our audience would choose the rock and be stimulated by it. The rest of us would choose the one that's more like ourselves, growing, living. We can care for it and be more stimulated by it. If I gave you the choice between the plant and your pet, we would again choose the one that's more alive, more responsive, more like ourselves, unless we happen to be allergic to or hate animals. Between your pet and your child, you know the answer. The one that's the fullest reflection of ourselves provides the greatest stimulation and the deepest capacity for joy. The implication is obvious, that human beings, as the children of God, have the capacity to return the greatest joy and the greatest inspiration to God. Now once again, uh, the joy that arises can be intangible or substantial. For example, a painter. When a painter envisions a work of art that he wants to create, he's already getting excited, being stimulated. And when he actually realizes the painting, fulfills it, the joy is substantial. But that painting, like the creation we've been talking about, is a symbol of his passion, joy, or sadness. The painting will never wrap its frame around him and cry or laugh with him. It's just a symbol. Likewise, for God, let us consider. God feels the fullness of joy when he is stimulated by his substantial object partners to feel his original internal nature and original external form through them. When the kingdom of heaven is realized through the fulfillment of the three great blessings and the establishment of the four position foundation, then that world becomes a good object partner that gives joy to God. Let's consider how that's accomplished. Let's define the three great blessings. The first blessing, to be fruitful, the key to it is the perfection of our individual character. The image used is that of a tree which grows to fruition. And the bearing of fruit represents the tree's reaching of maturity and fulfillment of its purpose. So the key to God's first blessing is the perfection of our individual character. An individual's mind and body are themselves discrete projections and object partners of God's dual characteristics. Now in order for an individual to perfect his or her character, he must form a four position foundation within himself, with his mind and body becoming harmonious, words and actions becoming consistent through give and take action with God as their center. This is a person of character and conscience. Such individuals become the temples of God, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 3.16. And they achieve oneness with God, as in John 14.20. They acquire God's divine nature and can experience the heart of God as if it were their own. Now, Jesus embodied such a standard. And therefore, the Bible calls him not only Son of God, which means most truly divine or product of divinity, but more often, it refers to Jesus as the Son of Man, most truly human. Because Jesus' words and actions were consistent, people can see and experience God through Him. Jesus not only said, love your enemy, He also embodied it. When He was there hanging on the cross and people were mocking at Him, cursing Him, spitting upon Him, if you're the Messiah, bring yourself down. When they put uh, uh, vinegar in his mouth and thorns in his uh, forehead and ultimately a spear in his side, all the while Jesus embraced and forgave them, crying out to God, forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they're doing. They don't realize the mistake they're making. In this sense, Jesus embodied the very forgiveness that he taught. Likewise, when Jesus said, whoever would be greatest among you, let him be your servant, the servant of all, Jesus lived that standard, truly living for the sake of others. Therefore, his words and actions were one, and we see God in Jesus. And Jesus had the right to say, as he did, when you see me, you see the Father. But is it Jesus alone who's meant to embody God's standard? 
He didn't say that. In Matthew 5.48, Jesus said, You, therefore, must become perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew 5.48. Perfection in this sense means the maturing and completion of our spiritual potential. Such a person is a person of character, conscience, integrity, and maturity. Let's consider the second blessing, to multiply. On the foundation of individual maturity of our first ancestors, God's second blessing was to be fulfilled by Adam and Eve after they had achieved individual perfection. Each, as a man or woman, would manifest a complementary aspect of God's dual characteristics. And so, as they entered into a relationship, formed a common base, and brought about new life, formed the true family, in order to construct the four-position foundation in their family, Adam and Eve should have joined in loving oneness as husband and wife, raised children. This would have been the fulfillment of the second blessing. Now, how about God's joy? God's joy, which would be initially realized when one individual became mature and could be an object to him, would now be expanded as husband and wife came together, expanding horizontally the capacity of their love. And then by birthing and raising children, they would experience parents' love, children's love, siblings' love, and all the dimensions of heart that are expressed in family relationships, thus expanding the capacity of this family to be an object of joy to God. And as this family became the basis for relationships in society between teacher and student, friend and friend, then the joy of God would expand with the expansion of these relationships. Now, this family or community itself then would become a good object partner giving joy to God. And such a God-centered family would become the basis of a good society, a strong nation, and a peaceful world. Now, God's third blessing then means the perfection of a human being's dominion over the natural world. Once again, we can see this four-position foundation realized. Now, to fulfill this blessing, the four-position foundation of dominion must be established centered on God. In other words, human beings at the level of God's image and the natural world as symbols of God must share love and beauty to become completely one. Ideal human beings then would receive stimulation from nature and feel immense joy. God could then delight in the universe through his children. How would human beings manifest this dominion, capacity for dominion? First, it's in our capacity for artistic creativity through art, music, or another form of expression, dance, etc. Secondly, it's in our capacity to understand and harness the powers of nature through agriculture or the development of medicine for the benefit of humankind. Thirdly, it's our capacity to extend our creativity through technology, airplanes, refrigerators, etc. to create a better quality of life, not for a few, but for everyone. Then it's also in our capacity to have a loving relationship with the natural world, animals, and our environment. It's in our stewardship and care for that environment, our capacity to own, take responsibility. All of these things are within our original nature to fulfill that third blessing. So, God's purpose of creation. Let's take a closer look at this purpose. Each of these three blessings re represents the fulfillment of a four-position foundation. Had God's purpose of creation been realized in this way, an ideal world without even a trace of sin, would have been established on the earth. We call this world the kingdom of heaven on earth. And Jesus taught us then to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Now, when life on earth comes to a close, people are to enter the spirit world and naturally enjoy eternal life in the kingdom of heaven there. For what is bound on earth will be bound in heaven. What is loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. 
This concludes part one of the principle of creation. In our next session, we'll finish this section to gain a deeper understanding of the structure and function of the universe, the position of human beings in it, and the nature and will of our Creator. Thank you very much.